So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whichever part of the world or from whichever country you're watching this program from. This is session five of epilepsy surgery, case by case, step by step. And we are in for an exciting new webinar. We started this webinar five sessions ago with an objective of trying to close the treatment gap for epilepsy surgery, especially in the developing country in the Asian Oceanian region. And I really thank the leadership of AO International League Against Epilepsy for having taken this initiative and also having given us this responsibility to take on this task. So today we have two extremely well-renowned faculty and we are in for a, an exciting new session, which is on MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy. And before I hand over to my colleague, Professor Kawai, it's my pleasant duty to introduce him. So Professor Kawai is a professor, Department of Neurosurgery at Gigi Medical University. He's also the vice director of Gigi Medical University, Japan and currently also happens to be the president-elect of Japanese Epilepsy Society. This program would not have been possible without the mentorship and leadership of Professor Akio Ikeda, the past chair of uh, uh, AOILE. And uh, just to briefly speak about him, he was a chair of Commission of Asian and Ocean and Affairs. Uh, he's the professor of Department of Epilepsy Movement Disorders and Physiology from Kyoto University. And of course, uh, we would also like to acknowledge the current cha chair of AOILE, Professor John Dunn, uh, who is from Australia. He's graduated from University of Western Australia and did his Epilepsy Fellowship from Mayo Clinic USA. And he's currently the professor, Department of Medicine from University of Western Australia and also the, also the current chair chair for the AOIL. So with this, I'd like to hand over uh, my mic to Professor Kawai to introduce today's faculty and then today's program. Okay, and uh, uh, before that, uh, uh, I uh, uh, again uh, uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Sarah Chandler. Uh, the, so this webinar series uh, is really uh, realized by uh, his devotion and effort. And uh, uh, we always uh, thank you. And uh, okay, so uh, let me introduce uh, today's faculty. And uh, first, uh, the Professor uh, Manjari uh, Toripachi, uh, Professor of Neurology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, she is actually uh, one of uh, the conveners and uh, so, uh, the, in every uh, the webinar, uh, uh, she uh, presented a uh, representative case. And uh, today again, uh, she will uh, present uh, her case of MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy, which is today's theme. And uh, uh, today uh, we have two uh, very famous uh, uh, epileptologists and epilepsy surgeons as uh, the, uh, the faculty. Uh, the, uh, Professor Alson Pak, uh, uh, Professor of Neurology at Columbia University, uh, Abbey Medical Center, uh, New York, uh, Presbyterian Hospital, and uh, Chief of uh, the Epilepsy and Sleep Division. Uh, so uh, she has focused her career on clinical care for epilepsy patients, uh, clinical re research and educating future generations of uh, neurologists and epilepsy specialists. And uh, within the uh, Epilepsy Center at Columbia, uh, she is the director of Epilepsy Monitoring Unit and co-director of the Epilepsy Surgery Program. Her research has focused on efforts of uh, anti-seizure medications on bone and mineral metabolism, as well as the care of women with epilepsy. And uh, today, as uh, she will uh, uh, give us uh, the didactic lecture about the pre-surgical evaluation of MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy. And uh, 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 the other uh, famous uh, the faculty is uh, Dr. Guy McCann, uh, Director of Epilepsy Surgery, Brain Mapping of, for Tumors and Epilepsy and uh, Adult uh, the Hydrocephalus. And uh, New York uh, Presbyterian Hospital. And uh, uh, Dr. 
Macan, uh, uh, not only as a neurosurgeon, but he also works as a translational uh, neuroscientist, uh, directing the Epirce Neurophysiology Laboratory, uh, helping uh, lead the multi-departmental study of cognitive neurophysiology, uh, together uh, with uh, the Dr. Uh, Catherine Chavon and uh, Charles Schroeder. And uh, today, uh, he'll uh, uh, give us uh, the uh, didactic lecture uh, of uh, epilepsy surgery uh, uh, for uh, MRI negative uh, type of epilepsy. Okay, so uh, Manjari, uh, could you start uh, your uh, case presentation? Thank you, Professor Kawai, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers. Uh, I'd like to thank our guest faculty for being here uh, to guide us through the case. Uh, so we've uh, had a series of temporal lobe, uh, you know, discussions. We've discussed dominant uh, temporal lobe lesional, non-dominant lesional, um, and then we've developed, uh, discussed MTLE, DNets, um, and other lesions. Uh, we are in the fifth case presentation today. Now, she's a young lady. She's 28 years old. Uh, she was married about, you know, two years, that is at the age of 26. And uh, she came to us about uh, two years back. Um, she had a long duration of seizures uh, from the time she was about 15 years of age. And uh, uh, so basically now she's 28 and the duration of epilepsy is about 13 years. And uh, initially the frequency was about, uh, you know, daily. It's, it's around one to three a day. But however, uh, when she came to us, it had kind of reduced, but not stopped. And she had about uh, five to six uh, per week, maybe a little less than one a day. There was no nocturnal uh, preponderance of these episodes. However, most of the episodes occurred at the wake time. In fact, uh, all the episodes we recorded in our epilepsy monitoring unit were in the wake state. However, the family did tell us that there were few episodes which did happen in sleep. So they told us about 80% of them do happen when she's awake and not in sleep. Now, the history given to us was by her husband and who was pretty caring and uh, reliable in his history giving. He had observed many of her episodes, particularly uh, since they were married for past two years. Um, she's a right-handed individual and of course, uh, she was educated, uh, well-educated. She was educated, she's done her college and she was planning to go in for a teacher's training program uh, to be a teacher. So he basically described uh, the first event. The second event was described uh, by her mother because the second event had virtually never happened after marriage. And in the first event, uh, she could describe and tell us that she used to have a feeling of discomfort behind her chest. And she would also have palpitations. And uh, the husband said she would give a silly smile. And so the silly smile would kind of herald to them that something was happening with her. But she would not speak uh, uh, when asked uh, anything. However, she would listen to them. She, If they told her something, they she would listen to them. But... Uh, kind of comprehend what's going on, but not be able to uh, bring out, uh, you know, much of uh, speech. Um, sometimes there seemed to be a lapse and a behavioral arrest. And the husband had noted oral, uh, perioral automatisms and uh, hand automatisms, which were bilateral. What is prominent in these seizures uh, was that at times, it was the ictal urinary incontinence, which uh, which told them that the seizure had happened. So they would miss out the initial part and she would not even indicate the aura. And the first thing they would realize is that she has been incontinent while sitting in the chair comfortably or uh, even on the sofa while watching the television. So, um, uh, and she, when asked, uh, uh, apart from the aura, she had absolutely no recollection uh, and had a complete amnesia for the events. And it was only later she would realize that she has actually soiled her clothes. So these events would typically be uh, very brief according to the husband. However, her inability to, to talk or to, you know, uh, speak out uh, something that they're asking would last for quite some time. 
So this history was there that uh, though she would, the event itself of the aura and, uh, you know, the automatisms was brief, but the inability to kind of talk after it was, uh, was quite extensive. Uh, the second event had never been witnessed by her husband and had happened only at her maternal home where um, she, she would have uh, this aura and uh, the parents did not recollect uh, because the last such event was in 2018, uh, which side the head would go to, uh, they were not sure whether it's the right or the left and it was followed by generalization. However, as the number of anti seizure drugs increased from two to three, these generalized episodes did not occur ever since uh, 2018. Uh, the parents do say that post dictally after the generalized episode, she used to be confused and this used to last for, uh, you know, more than uh, a minute. So these were the two uh, Caesar types she had. With this history, um, when we looked into her past antecedent events, uh, there was no history of febrile seizures, there was no history of encephalitis, uh, there was no head injuries. Uh, seemingly out of the blue, she started having these episodes at the age of 15. Uh, we had, uh, you know, her on three anti seizure medicines, which were levetiracetam, uh, carbamazepine, and uh, clobazam in good doses. Uh, however, these uh, episodes continued. She did not have any focal neurological uh, deficits, any neurocutaneous markers, her visual fields were normal. So her interictal EG, um, this is her sleep part of the interictal EG. And we can see here uh, that uh, there is an uh, interesting finding. Of course, it's not a sleep montage, uh, it's um, uh, epilepsy montage. You can see the sleep spindle, which is seen very well on the right frontal central chain. So uh, you can see a spindle happening in the right frontal central chain, which seems to be absent in the left frontal central chain. So that was the first thing that struck the eye. Then there were these, uh, there was this burst of uh, discharge uh, following the sleep spindle and it seemed to have some kind of polymorphic slowing around the left uh, frontal temporal region, um, though it was not certain and then there were some of these sharps which were seen in the left temporal region. So this was the first interictal snapshot uh, which was seen in the double banana montage. Uh, Alison, would you uh, like to uh, defer or uh, would you like to opine on uh, the interictal snapshot? <clears throat> no, absolutely. I mean, I think your eyes, uh, the, uh, the, the dropout of the sleep spindle is quite marked. And I would agree there that there is some um, polymorphic slowing seen on the, the left, but um, I do think that, as you say, the, the most marked and interesting uh, finding there is the dropout of the sleep spindle on the left, which, as you say, draws your eye to that area and uh, really highlights that polymorphic slowing. Yeah, so so we did look at the interictal in another montage. Uh, this is another snapshot, not the same uh, epic. Uh, it is an interictal uh, in the circumferential montage. And we can see here that there are these multiple uh, sharps which are seen with a phase reversal uh, around T3. Mm. Um, Alison, uh, would you concur with these? The sharps are, also, are seen bilaterally. They are seen on both the hemispheres. However, they seem to be kind of um, better on the left temporal around T3. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would uh, concur with that. I mean, they, they definitely, um, they're broadly distributed, as you say, with bilateral, you, you see them bilaterally, um, but they do seem more prominent, they do appear more prominent, as you say, on the, um, on the left, but they absolutely, but they are, but they are bilaterally seen with a broad, I mean, and it may be that it's just a broader field. So with the history and the interictals really, um, with the history, we did think that it could be temporal because there were palpitations and there were there was discomfort, uh, retrosternal, you know, kind of a fear, and uh, there seemed to be some kind of ictal um, aphasia. She was unable to speak for quite some time. 
So uh, the pre-AMU hypothesis before connecting her to the video EG would be a temporal, um, temporal, possibly temporal onset with no red flags because there was no visual aura, there was no sensory aura, there was no nocturnal preponderance, uh, there was no auditory aura. So one would tend to think that it is either anterior mesial uh, temporal, um, Alison, or uh, would you would you think we should consider other possibilities? I mean, the other, uh, you know, certainly the, uh, you know, when we think about the semiology, we, you know, we think about the onset of, and the propagation, and certainly the mesial temporal area seems to be involved, as you suggest, with the, yeah, uh, I do quest wonder about that smile that you had described um, initially at the initial onset. And, you know, I, I, that may suggest, for example, a singular onset. Um, so that's, uh, anyway, that was just another yeah. thought that I had. Yeah, yeah I, I concur that the, um, that the semiology is suggestive of uh, temporal lobe. And the aphasia, the aphasia would, uh, of course, <clears throat> in, you know, ladder lives to the left. And uh, we're starting to see that on the, uh, with the um, interictal EEG as well. So, yeah, thank you, Alison. So uh, the reason we uh, kind of uh, zero down on the hypothesis of where it comes from is that the epilepsy monitoring unit needs to be prepared the staff in the epilepsy monitoring unit need to know that uh, it's happening mostly at the daytime and there is some language issue and so the testing can be appropriate if they are nocturnal seizures then we need to tell them uh, because ictal specs can't be done in the night time and then they need to get a patient to sleep uh, during the spec uh, injection hour so that's why a hypothesis uh, before connecting to the uh, monitoring unit is kind of helpful at least for the staff staff there to be prepared so uh, we recorded several of our events uh, over a period of 10 days uh, in our epilepsy monitoring unit some of them were prolonged and some of them were very brief and so i will just run the video and then we can discuss it uh, later uh, the testing is in Hindi, so I'm not sure uh, everybody attending from all over the world would be able to understand, but I will uh, kind of uh, uh, talk about it at the end. She indicates that something has happened. She rubs her hands. looks around, she obeys commands, she's comprehending. She's unable to name she understands her name is me. She just says this, she's unable to name what it is. She just says yay, which means this, but she doesn't know what this is. I mean, she's not able to name it. She's fully, uh, you know, just manipulating the papers out there. Unable to name the pictures, the cup, banana. Unable to read. Turning pages around. So she's not really listening to the instruction. She's just. Uh, fumbling with the pages, he's asked her to read, he's asked her to name the pictures, which she was unable to do. A rather prolonged episode. Unable to tell what the staff is showing her.
kind of brings her left hand to the face, then also the right hand. So quiet for some time, she's unable to answer anything. But she doesn't look like any dystonia or anything else. So Still unable to name a hen. So there's a reading instruction there, close your eyes. She's unable to read and do it. She's just moving her fingers along the line. And that continues for quite some time before she recovers. Here she smiles, looks around. This is the next episode. Does something with the hands again. The husband realizes she's having an episode. She feels discomfort. She tells her name. She's able to tell her name. This episode was very brief. Again, complaints of discomfort. Ghabrahat is palpitations of fear. So she had fear and palpitations. Comprehending, showing the tongue. Obeying commands, lifting the hand. She says she's all right now. So she's basically had three episodes so far. The first one was very long. The other two were very brief. Just the aura and some bimanual automatism. This is the fourth event. 
She indicates she is uncomfortable. This is the event in which the ethyl spec was done. So this was the ethyl spec event and the injection was given within 10 seconds. So um, basically uh, with these events, uh, uh, the interpretation of these events by us was that uh, the first one, which was pretty prolonged, where she had um, some aura because she indicates uh, with her hand and then she had some, uh, you know, wringing of the hands together followed by um, ability to uh, obey um, instructions, but inability to name, read for quite some time. Even reading comprehension was impaired. Though verbal comprehension seemed um, okay. The other two, other three events were mostly discomfort and fear and palpitations. With some, um, some uh, automatisms for a very brief amount of time. In one, there seemed to be a nose or face white with the left hand, but I was not very sure of it at all. And um, uh, looking at these events, uh, my interpretation was that uh, they are probably uh, involving uh, a network which involves the amygdala as well as uh, the hippocampus and uh, Naming anomia is not something which is very specific to a particular area. It's very broad. But she was definitely not able to read. So there was some dominant hemisphere involvement. Um, and I would think of a left temporal localization. Um, Alison, would you like to... Uh, <clears throat> Yes, um, thank you. Uh, very uh, interesting clinical presentation. And certainly when we're faced with these cases, the semiology or the, the you know, uh, detailed review of the clinical presentation is very important, building on your hypothesis as you were discussing earlier. And so what strikes me here are the bland features, as you mentioned. Was she able to clarify any further what kind of aura she had? Because the clinical presentation of the aura can be very helpful within temporal lobe epilepsy. Was she able to say what that aura was yes. later on? Yes. So even uh, just as the event, third event finished, she told her mother she had ghabrahat, uh, which means uh, she had palpitations and a sense of fear. Yeah, uh, yeah you what, had said that earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, <clears throat> and then, uh, so that with the, um, and as you say, there's no lateralizing features for, with a dystonia or anything to, um, to help with that, um, the prolonged aphasia. So all of those uh, features together, as I say, the bland presentation, the possible nose wipe on the left, um, as well, the uh, prolonged aphasia, the fear palpitations, um, all of that together would suggest temporal lobe semiology. And I agree, hippocampal, perhaps insular. I mean, there was at one point where she was grabbing, um, where she was rubbing her throat. That could yeah. be insular as well, along with the palpitations. So I certainly agree at this point. And uh, I think you, it, this case really highlights the importance of thorough review of the uh, semiology to help us build our hypothesis as we proceed. Thank you, Alison. I think we'll go ahead with her pictal uh, EG. So, um, you know, just to uh, for the students here that, uh, you know, um, when there is uh, an aura which she, which could have been interpreted as a retrosternal epigastric, it would uh, point out to the anterior insula amygdala orbitofrontal area, as Alison said, and amygdala is core in that network. If there is fear and palpitations, um, uh, you could uh, again think of mesial temporal amygdala activation. Um, behavioral arrest, of course, we didn't see in, much in this, but uh, in the seizures which she had uh, subsequent to her implantation, there was some behavioral arrest in some of them. So that would also suggest a limbic uh, involvement. And she did have automatisms, which uh, kind of were uh, like uh, rubbing her hands, uh, wringing hands together, and then some. Uh, my just semi-clapping 
and uh, that would again uh, you know um, indicate uh, uh, inactivation uh, she did have them bilaterally it was not unilateral because unilateral automatisms uh, would indicate an ipsilateral involvement so here you really can't lateralize based on that because they were bilateral and um, uh, 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 they would indicate uh, uh, ultimate uh, involvement of the cingulate uh, cortex in the network. So we go on to uh, postictal uh, aphasia. Uh, we know that uh, speech is a function of the dominant hemisphere and she's a right-handed individual. So we know that her dominance would be in all probability the left, uh, you know, side or left hemisphere. And um, uh, she did have uh, inability to name and to read and to comprehend what was written. So uh, that would again indicate uh, that there is an involvement of uh, the, you know, the dominant temporal lobe uh, in the network. The postictal nose wipe, though it was not certain, there was something on the face which she did with the left hand, and it should occur within 60 seconds of the termination of the event. Though the postictal aphasia traditionally, you know, the postictal aphasia should persist for more than two minutes, and we did see in her it persisted for quite some time. So the postictal nose wipe should just occur within 60 seconds of the termination of the event, which it did. And it indicates activation of the central autonomic network. And uh, probably uh, one hypothesis is an increase in nasal secretions. And um, since, uh, you know, the left hand uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is the ipsilateral hand, uh, the other hand is kind of in a neglect or inhibition. So uh, there is a nose wipe with the ipsilateral hand. Now, in the history, we did get an ictal urinary urge. Uh, in one of the events in the monitoring unit, she had passed urine during uh, the brief episode. Uh, so that would, uh, you know, suggest that there is an involvement of the mesial frontal uh, paracentral lobule um, or the opercula of the region of the temple. And uh, it's mostly seen in non-dominant temporal lobe, but it can occur elsewhere also. So looking at the ictal EEG, uh, this is uh, the event here. And... Uh, the only difference uh, which could be made out is, of course, she's blinking very frequently, is that there is some uh, delta which comes in at the anterior temporal electrode, which is T1. Uh, sorry. Um, over here. But it's also seen to a lesser extent on the right, but it's more higher amplitude and well-defined in the anterior temporal on the left as we can see here. And then uh, this is subsequent, the next epic mm, doesn't show pretty much, shows some sharp, some fast activity intermixed with some fast activity, again, better delineated on the left, evolves further. Now it's like a little better defined, the delta on the left, but it does not preclude the right temporal. And it tends to go a little posteriorly here again. Uh, so though we thought it's T1, uh, there is some uh, delta, which is rhythmic delta, which is seen around T5. And then she goes, does this, uh, a very funny kind of fast, followed by, I don't know whether it was some movement, she moved around, but this is what happens to her EG. And this is further, further, further further so really you can't differentiate between the sides here at some times it looks uh, you know better defined on the right um, but it's bilateral so uh, here is the second event and we see here that there are frequent blinkings of course so I go to the next epic and the first change which we see is a fast rhythm, which is unlike the uh, delta which we saw in the first episode around T3 and T5. And there are some sharps which are seen um, in the right temporal, but essentially what is noticeable is a sudden change in the rhythm in the third second of the epic, 
with a fast activity coming in at T3 and T5. And then this further evolves and further evolves. And you can see the rhythmic sharps and almost spiky in nature on the left F7 T3 with high amplitudes uh, around F7 T3. It is uh, reflecting in the right tempo F84 also, but definitely the rhythm is spikier and faster and higher in amplitude at F7 T3. Alison, uh, should I move it faster or slower? No, you're, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So it further evolves uh, to show uh, this rhythm, again, better delineated around the left uh, temporal chain. Yeah, it's much better organized on the left. You can yeah. certainly see so, that. And consistent yeah, so. with the first, whereby you had that um, with the delta initially, was, there was a clear phase reversal on the left that was better yeah. seen than on the right. So this is the third event where the event starts with a phase reversing uh, T1. Uh, it's also reflected on the right, but it's it's just one montage. So I really, one electrode. So I really don't know how to interpret that, but uh, towards the end of the epoch, you can find the broad slowing all over the left hemisphere. This is the and, ag and again in this bipolar montage, you see a much clearer phase reversal on the left than on the uh, than on the right. <clears throat> and I think the important piece here is that it's not independent on the right. You know, I mean, yeah. certainly um, we see it reflected on the right, and we see a field to the right, but it's not independent on the right, and it's consistent across all the seizures. Yeah, correct. So that's something which is very valuable, Alison. I've, I should have uh, thought about it, that uh, when the left is seen, the same time the right is seen there, yeah. So again, you can see it's broader and higher in amplitude and better delineated on the left side, the slowing with the sharps as compared to the right. So further evolves and that uh, ends there. So, so these were the uh, ictal patterns. Uh, in uh, two of them, there was a slowing with a reversal and in uh, around F7, T3, T1. And in one of them, it started with a fast kind of activity. So there was different rhythm in uh, two of them had the slow onsets, slow delta, and one had a fast uh, at F73. So um, how would we interpret that? Would it suggest that um, um, it could suggest a dysplastic, the fast uh, rhythm could suggest that there could be a dysplasia or uh, yeah, that's a, a very, <clears throat> very good point. Um, you know, when we see those slow rhythms, that suggests more subcortical structures. But when you see the faster frequencies like that, that is can correlate with more, as you say, uh, cortical dysplasia. And there have been, you know, good studies over the years demonstrating that. So that is very curious. And um uh, to and certainly something that we would want to think about, particularly um, given the fact, as you say, this is MRI negative, and so that that finding is important here. Yeah. So, um, so that's what we thought in our pre-surgical evaluation meetings, which we have with the neuroradiologist and the neurosurgeons and the new nuclear medicine, the neuropsychologists, and the neuropsychologist had evaluated her by the time we got to our meeting. And um, uh, we can see here the verbal memory, which is subserved by the dominant uh, temporal lobe. The immediate recall was impaired, the delayed recall was intact, long term retention was intact. Visual spatial functioning, visual memory, immediate as well as, well as, as, well as delayed was impaired, which was surprising. So she had involvement of both the dominant temporal as well as the non dominant temporal. And from this, it looks like the dominant, uh, the non-dominant was slightly more hit than the dominant temporal. However, the visual construction ability, which is essentially parietal, was intact. Uh, IQ was 90 and uh, her attention was good. So she was attentive to the tasks which were being given to her. So this was a little worrisome to us because 
we really don't want to intervene in a patient where the both the temporal lobes are kind of already hit um, in terms of memory. Um, and we were surprised by these results. Uh, one way to interpret it was that her 15 years, uh, you know, her 13 years history of seizures, and she's been on multiple drugs and multiple seizures. So it's not just the drug resistant epilepsy substrate, which is impacting her, her functioning. It's probably the, the number of seizures and the number of drugs and the duration of epilepsy, which is responsible for this bilateral hit. Uh, that, that is what we thought, but Alison, would you, uh, would you, uh, you be very cautious about this kind of finding of bilateral? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, there's bilateral findings here. And as you say, I mean, we, we always want to balance this when we approach these patients surgically, you know, we want to better understand where the seizures are coming from. But as we approach the surgery uh, idea, we certainly do not want to um, subject them to significant deficits. And so when you have bilateral dysfunction like this, one does worry about that. And, and I agree with your assessment. I think that um, in an individual who has been having seizures for um, well over 10 years at this point, you worry about the um, impact of those seizures as well as you say the anti-seizure medications. But yeah, th these are, um, she has bilateral findings. So at this point in time, the neuropsychology, it doesn't necessarily help, so to speak, in terms of uh, lateralizing the epileptogenic zone. And as you say, it raises some question as to you know, how we're gonna approach this um, as we proceed. Yeah, thanks, Alison. So um, this also helps when we're counseling uh, the family uh, for uh, maybe a resection or, uh, you know, that they could be an impact uh, post-operatively. So we go on to the neuroimaging, which has been provided by the Department of Neuroradiology, Dr. Guy Kwad and Dr. Karp. And uh, first I go ahead with MRI flare action. Um, So uh, should I repeat it? Yes, yes. So I can do the temporal lobe slowly. So what we're looking for here is any subtle findings, any thickening, gyral thickening, and blurring of the gray-white junction. And and as you go through, it's uh, you know your, your gray-white junction is well delineated. It's so I'm not seeing any clear findings. Uh, Guy, and the surgeon, neurosurgeon. Yeah, I think I think the, the only thing just uh, noticing on the MRI is that which is not it's not uh, strongly lateralizing, but the the MRI is very well done. It's very symmetric when we look at the eyeballs, so it's not offset at all. And and the left temporal pole is a little atrophic in comparison with the right. Oh, okay. Good pickup. <laughs> the surgeons always pick up something. I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is Kawaii. Uh, I noticed some hippocampal uh, sulcus laminate, but that is not epigenic. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Kawaii, uh, which side, Dr. Kawaii? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, there are some uh, hippocampal sulcus laminate I noticed, oh, okay. but that is not epigenic. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. So we go to the next. Uh, sorry. Repeating. So, we can go slowly again on the temples. So, cingulate was another area, so we can just look at those, you know, uh, where we thought of. Oh, oh stop, stop, stop. 
So singulate insula temporal Uh, anything, uh, Dr. Kensuke, Dr. Allison, Dr. Guy? No. <laughs> no, no. I, I just think one other thing that's interesting is for a college graduate, 28 year old, it, it lends credence to your hypothesis that the neuropsychology may be chronic seizures because there is, there is a little bit of atrophy and volume loss and a little bit of ventriculomegaly for a 28 year old. And I suspect that there's been some volume loss over time from chronic secondary generalized seizures. And I, I agree with you, Guy, it's not localizing, but there's definitely uh, you know more prominent atrophy, atrophy than what you would expect in someone of this age. So uh, shall we see the T1? So essentially nothing there again. It's a very nice MRI though. It's very, it's very clear. <clears throat> yeah, our neuroradiology team is very good. Uh, they're never satisfied by an outside MRI and I'm glad <laughs> they are not. <laughs> so nothing there. So, you know, now, so we're going to skip this and we're just going to go to the PET. So since we had a normal MRI, she uh, invariably these patients get discussed for at least three times or sometimes even four times uh, in the epilepsy uh, surgery meeting. So uh, after the first read of the MRI being normal, we generally do a PET MRI fusion. Uh, oh, sorry, we do a PET and followed by a fusion because we don't have the PET MRI, which we're supposed to be getting. But uh, this was the first look at the PET MRI. And what we could see is a definite difference between the left uh, and the right in terms of uh, the metabolism. And the left uh, BC temple and anterior temple uh, did look um, hypermetabolic. Yeah, that's quite clear. You can see yeah. that. Yeah. And it persisted for uh, sections above. So, and as you okay. say, it's in the basal and mesial yeah. strong areas. Basal and mesial. And then the difference disappears. So, uh, but still, you can see that the mesial on the left compared to the right, uh, there is this difference in uh, the metabolism. Uh, which is there. So this is the finding we got uh, on the second discussion after her pet. Um, and this, again, it persists for much of the basal areas as compared to the right. And maybe uh, crossed uh, cerebral uh, dyskiasis. Okay. Did mm. I miss that? Mm. Uh, this one you were saying? Uh, uh, the, you know, decrease uh, on the right. This one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, crossed uh, hypo on the left. Okay. Is that. In addition, a little higher up. Um, this, uh, this we are not very certain about, but there was some difference between the right and the left. So, these were the only two areas which we found a difference between the hemispheres. There didn't seem to be an apparent difference in the insula or cingulates or frontal lobe, mesial frontal lobe, because of the unary incontinence, we were keen on the mesial frontal lobe too. Mm -hmm. uh, this is seen here and here. The rest of the cingulate, insula, mesial frontal did not seem different. So, BC frontal, mesial frontal, insula, all looked symmetrical.
so nothing much out there and so this was in the coronals and the sagittal can't be made out but uh, this is the right and this is the left so we have this area here and we had this on the right the similar sections but so overall we thought that her left temporal bc temporal and anterior mesial temporal was hypometabolic she had had an ictal suspect which was injected after 15 seconds uh, and this is what her syscom showed a left posterior marginal bc temporal inferior temporal but it was a little middle it was in the middle it wasn't anterior uh, as we thought in the mri uh, in the pet mri fusion that it was anterior it was middle posterior bc so but it was the left side now with this we went back to her mri and when we looked at her mri the neuroradiologist, you know, now once we've done all this, the neuroradiologist again keenly looks at the MRI and what he thought was that the invaginations of the white matter or the fringes of the white or fingers of the white matter were going very well into the right temporal lobe, but on the left temporal lobe here, there seemed to be, uh, you know, these <clears throat> white matter in, mm -hmm. like were missing. Similarly. Was that seen on multiple cuts? Because that's quite clear uh, there. Yeah. 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 It was seen. Uh, uh, it was seen in two or three. So we can go back to the images, and you know, this happens in retrospect. Invariably, it happens in retrospect. Mm -hmm. We don't. We don't see it on the first read ever. It's like but, we. we well, you're we, looking at it through a different lens, right? As yeah. A, so <laughs> after point. looking at the pet and. After looking at the syscom, uh, we go back and we keenly look at um, it and then, you know, we say, okay, maybe, but it's not like there, there that you can, <laughs> and that to dominant. And, and so here, if you look here, there's a white matter here, but it looks kind of fuzzy here. And as guys said there seems to be a smaller size of the left temporal lobe compared to the right uh, so the size of the temporal lobes was different again and if you look at this um, again here there seems to be some the doubt but here there seems to be some kind of a blue uh, yes yes ramesh it's visible yes sir so With already we have discussed extensively on uh, the plan of action in this patient and uh, finally we planned that uh, phase two will be a better option for this patient. So we did the uh, plan in this patient bilateral anterior middle bilateral middle and posterior temporal uh, electrodes based on the semiology as it was mostly uh, although it was left temporal but there were uh, features of right as well. Apart from that, we had uh, implanted this left-sided basic temporal uh, based on the CISCOM finding. Bilateral cingulate and uh, bilateral anterior insula along with the right posterior insular uh, electrodes was also planned based on the uh, features on the semiology. We use this standard protocol, uh, which we have adapted from Rothschild uh, uh, Epilepsy Center from Paris. And uh, the standard temporal exploration involves whole of the temporal lobe from anterior, middle, and posterior, along with the sentinel electrode in the frontal uh, region, as well as the standard insular, where we uh, place the anterior as well as the posterior. And also uh, we uh, uh, base of the, uh, forming a base of the triangle, like triangulating three electrodes in the insula. So these are the standard protocol we follow, although uh, due to resource constraints and uh, we try to uh, reduce the number of electrodes we place. Similarly, cingulate electrodes, this is a, a protocol we follow as such. So in this particular patient, we actually planned, as I already told, uh, left-sided anterior middle posterior, as well as the right-sided again anterior middle posterior, bilateral cingulate, and then bilateral insula with a right posterior insular uh, electrode. 
So I will be showing a brief video. Amesh, you, can, you can also tell why we place the basic temporal, which was as per the spec localization. Yes. Sir. So the left side left of, uh, on, on this uh, imaging, this is from the uh, robotic platform. The left is left and right is la uh, right. So this particular uh, electrode is on the left side, which actually is encompassing through the posterior uh, uh, cortical area along with the left basic temporal region. This was basically, uh, we had a uh, spec positivity. So with this, we plan these electrodes uh, one uh, well day ahead before the day of surgery. And uh, this is a short video on how we uh, perform. We uh, do a robotic guided placement using a, a robot. Predominant this is already has been described. So I'll just skip this part. Predominant right sided temporal localization. So these were possibility of insula and simulate cortices were also considered in view of ictal urinary incontinence. Following the comprehensive epilepsy surgery meeting, placement of 12 SEG electrodes were planned, covering the anterior, middle and the posterior temporal lobes, encompassing both the lateral neocortex, as well as the mesial structures, including the amygdala and the hippocampus. An additional left basic temporal electrode were planned based on the spec finding, along with bilateral cingulate and insular electrodes. The patient is positioned supine, head is fixed with a Mayfield clamp and attached to the robotic arm to achieve a rigid fixation. Alternatively, lexal frame G can be used as a head holder, which is ergonomically better than the Mayfield clamp, as it allows free space without hindering the movement of the robotic arm, especially if bilateral temporal electrodes are planned. A three-post fixation of lexal frame may be useful if skin-based laser registration is performed which is otherwise not required in case of bone judicial based robotic registration. We routinely use skin based laser registration, which begins initially with a six point facial registration. This is followed by the mesh registration covering the nose and the forehead region, followed by zigzag laser scanning of the forehead and then subsequently manual scanning of the bilateral temple regions. So the skin-based registration we used is uh, accurate and we have compared both skin-based as well as judicial-based. So accuracy is comparable and uh, rather the skin-based uh, marking is more feasible, lesser invasive and After then the registration less time. is complete, the accuracy of the registration is checked by pointing the laser to all the six points. The aim here is to attain a minimum error. If the error is more than one millimeter, then the points can be manually adjusted to correct it. In case of persistence of the error, re-registration should be done. So the now the marked trajectories, which we uh, do it one day prior. The robotic arm is driven to the desired trajectory and the entry point is marked as per the laser pointer. The patient is draped as per the marked entry point. A 2.1 mm twist drill craniostomy is performed using a pneumatic handheld drill by directly drilling through the scalp without a stab incision. A stopper should always be fixed at a distance equal to the scalp and the bone thickness measured on the robotic platform so as to prevent inadvertent entry into the brain parenchyma. An important pearl here is to place the robotic adapter closely opposed to the scalp in order to avoid any play of the drill bit, thereby avoiding cross deviations. While drilling, the surgeon can very well appreciate resistance initially representing the outer cortical bone followed by a giveaway feel denoting entry into the diploic space. This is again followed by a resistance suggestive of inner cortical margin and a final giveaway suggesting entry into the epidural space. This is followed by dural coagulation using a monopolar cautery. Now the anchor bolt is tightened into the drill craniostomy using a set screwdriver till the good bony purchase is appreciated. So the Bony purchase is very important. And uh, once we tighten it, we the surgeon feels the bony purchase. It's usually around three Following to four turns. The stopper is tightened, opposing the top of the robotic adapter. And the distance to target, that is the distance A, portrayed on the robotic frame is noted. This is the important part here. Distance P is measured as shown in the video. It is imperative at this step to avoid moving the robotic arm till the insertion of the electrode is complete. So 
So this is the length of the electrode to be inserted is calculated. The length of the SEG electrode to be implanted is calculated by negating the distance B from A, also minus 3 mm, to account for the three turns of the cap over the anchor pole. A variety of electrodes are available commercially, capable of simultaneous recording, stimulation, and radio frequency listening if required. The appropriate length of the electrode is then inserted through the anchor bolt. And the cap is tightened over the bolt snugly. Following which the stylet is pulled out. So Ramesh, I think we can stop now. We are running a bit. Okay, fine, sir. So once this is done, uh, we always do a warm we spin. We perform a warm spin after the first electrode placement to confirm our uh, trajectory. Time. And uh, once that is done, uh, once we are confirmed, we don't repeat it for the subsequent uh, electrodes. And uh, after implantation, this is how it looks like. After Following implantation, we again repeat the uh, CT scan in a thin cut uh, fashion and then merge it with the preoperative MRI and see the trajectories. Once we are uh, sure enough, then we, we also take the patient for recording in the ICU to confirm the findings. Okay. We, we showed this because there are a lot of students. So we just wanted to show how the CG is done. But uh, the downside is we are running, actually we are run out of time. Yes. So Manjari, could you please expedite the CG if you don't mind? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Ramesh, uh, for uh, showing us this uh, excellent uh, uh, video. So I had left here and I'm going to skip these uh, slides. Uh, so uh, her intellectuals, um, so the top, uh, the topmost till here belong to the right hemisphere. And these are the left hemisphere uh, implantations. And the deep blue we see here is the left middle temporal inner contacts, which show these interictal uh, bursts of spikes, high amplitude. Um, also seen to a certain extent on, in the reds here, the reds being the left basi temporal. <laughs> Uh, again, we see here uh, some spikes in the left green fluorescent ones, which is the left <clears throat> inner contacts of the left posterior temporal, which uh, Ramesh tells me was in the posterior hippocampus. So these were the interictal uh, findings um, during the monitoring. This is the left posterior temporal inner contacts, and uh, the red is the BC temporal, and the blue was the left middle temporal. So the ictal onsets were characterized by uh, almost the whole of the red firing with a low voltage, high frequency, um, which is seen here. Almost simultaneously, the outer contacts of the left posterior temporal were firing. And that's where uh, the spect was from. And then subsequently, uh, does get picked up on the right-sided electrodes also. This is the further evolution of the event where the blue also comes in, which is the left middle temporal. And we see some right hippocampal spikes also happening. This is just the beginning of the event spread out. Uh, we can see here that uh, the left PC temporal, um, one, two, three, and uh, to a certain extent after that is the left posterior temporal contacts, which are uh, starting and then later on uh, the right middle temporal and the right anterior temporal coming. Uh, I will not show the video of the event. The event was very typical of uh, what she had had, but in the event in the SEG plantation, she had a lot of oral automatisms, which uh, she's not responding. So the whole event is pretty prolonged, but uh, again, the same uh, kind of rhythm. But here, the second event is uh, the blue, which is the left middle temporal by the fluorescent green, which is the left posterior temporal, and then the left basic temporal come in. 
and then uh, this is um, how it evolves. So this is just the onsets, the left middle temporal uh, one and two ev evolution. Again, this is just to show you um, the left middle temporal uh, inner contacts were here. <clears throat> Multiple events, uh, almost similar. <clears throat> left middle temporal and then it does also go to the left anterior temporal very much similar almost all events so then uh, we did uh, perform stimulation and uh, the stimulation produced the habitual events uh, in these areas which is uh, left middle temporal again and uh, followed by the left posterior temporal a low voltage high frequency activity uh, which is seen this is post stimulation the bursts are seen here uh, i don't have time to show you all the stimulation but she was very cooperative uh, did all the tasks we asked her to do this is uh, the uh, we generally perform uh, uh, we do not perform high frequency stimulation for the hippocampus uh, nor do we perform high frequency stimulation in uh, children. Uh, so, but for her, we did do a high frequency stimulation, uh, 50 hertz, uh, 0.5 to 1 milliseconds, and uh, intensity of 0.5 to 5 uh, milliamps, of 3 to 8 seconds. So, pretty much the same uh, pattern which was seen in all the events, whether they were stimulation induced or they occurred during stimulation or they occurred spontaneously. So, uh, to conclude, uh, the, uh, the SEG implantation confirmed that uh, uh, there was a, uh, habitual seizures which came in um, from the left middle temporal inner contacts, um, the left PC temporal outer contacts, and uh, also the left posterior temporal without involving the comprehension uh, areas. So with this, uh, we went ahead. Uh, there was no activity recorded from the cingulate or the insular or the any of those electrodes. Um, so uh, I think I'll ask Dr. Chandra to take over here. Um, any comments, uh, Alison? Uh... No, that was uh, really nice recordings and uh, quite clear. Thank you. So. so uh, so we, we went ahead and did an anterior temporal lobectomy. So could I have the next slide? So we use electrocardiography as a baseline to understand what is the uh, overall uh, activity of the brain. So we use it more like a background monitoring system. And when we put an electrocardiography, we found that it was very severe, grade five. Next slide. So you could see that it was pretty much abnormal all over. And then we went ahead and did the anterior temporal lobectomy, sparing the amygdala and the hippocampus, after which the electrocardiography became grade three. There was some improvement, but definitely not completely. And then we put, we then resected the amygdala because definitely there was activity coming from amygdala, sparing the hippocampus. And once we removed the amygdala, the whole electrocardiography became completely normal. So it came to grade two, which is quite uh, reasonable. Uh, so we managed to spare the hippocampus, but we had to resect the anterior and the middle uh, lateral lobe resection as well as the amygdala resection. And uh, with this, the patient had become seizure free. So we do use, you know, it's not like the traditional ECG which has been taught by the French. So we kind of combine it with the electrocorticography to fine tune our resection. So with this, I will end this case and... Uh, uh, no, no, not end. Uh, so she's been with us now for one year. For the first six months, she was completely seizure free. Uh, but now, uh, since the past six months, she's been having brief episodes without urinary incontinence, with just uh, the lack of awareness. So uh, one of the things which we are thinking is, uh, did we do right in leaving her uh, posterior hippocampus, hippocampus uh, behind? But we were worried about her memories, uh, memory, 
you know, involvement. Um, and uh, she's now angle two, uh, not an angle one that, you know, we would have wanted. So her histopathology uh, showed uh, uh, FCD type 1B uh, of the left BC temporal. So um, type 1B would be, you know, just an abnormal tangential cortical lamination. So I'd like to commence uh, from, uh, from Guy and from Allison and from Kensuke as to uh, the angle two outcome, which we see in a so-called normal uh, imaging. Mm, could it be because uh, we've left uh, the hippocampus uh, behind and should we have removed it considering the fact that her memory was impacted bilaterally? I think, you know, the um, certainly it suggests that there's some epileptogenic tissue remaining, but at the same time, I think your approach, I, I fully agree with your approach in the sense that um, you, leaving the hippocampus at that point, given the concern for memory, and obviously, you know, given your ECOG findings, as well as validated by the six months of seizure freedom, that um, you, you removed the the majority at that point in time of the epileptogenic network, um, but as stated, there are there is some remaining epileptogenic uh, tissue. But I think your approach was uh, very reasonable. Guy. Yeah, I uh, I I completely agree, and this is a very challenging case because. You, you would you would uh, hypothesize that if you removed all of the mesial temporal structures, and I also commend you for not just saving the hippocampus, but saving the parahippocampal basal temporal inputs to a lot of the hippocampus, which probably kept her verbal memory intact. But if you if you take all of those structures, a she's very likely to have a significant verbal memory deficit, which she would notice even more because her contralateral side is weak, and b you know, based on your evaluation, which was very, very thorough, you removed the areas that were the primary epileptogenic zone of the network. And I would argue right now, if you were going to do more, you would probably have to re-implant her to know exactly what was the area of desired resection now. So I think everything you did was spot on in terms of saving her function and trying to maximize her seizure benefit. Dr. Kenzuki? Uh, I so this is kind of my uh, the uh, way of uh, doing the. I think I cannot uh, the uh, resect the uh, neocortical and basal uh, dominant side temporal lobe without the uh, the you know the subdual uh, language mapping, the you know uh, two dimensional uh, mapping, and and. I'm afraid uh, that uh, without that, uh, your resection uh, might be uh, not uh, sufficient uh, uh, or, uh, you know, very adequate. And uh, I, I agree uh, that you uh, leave the hippocampus uh, intact, but uh, in, uh, if uh, <laughs> this is my case, uh, that I will do uh, the uh, uh, according to the interoperative uh, ecology, uh, the, for example, hippocampal uh, transaction and uh, on the lateral, basal and lateral neocortex, uh, I will do the uh, multiple sulfide transaction and uh, the resection of, you know, safe area, uh, according to the uh, uh, the subdual uh, mapping. And another point is, uh, I'm very much interested uh, in uh, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, where is uh, responsible for res residual seizures? So I'm uh, very much uh, uh, keen uh, uh, to know uh, uh, the result of uh, the first, uh, the, just the you know, scalp uh, VEG of uh, uh, present uh, status. Yeah. So she's slated uh, for uh, epilepsy monitoring visit uh, mm -hmm. at the end of this month. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, often uh, uh, experience uh, these cases uh, that, you know, the remaining contralateral uh, foci uh, uh, in, in, yeah, in this kind of an uh, MRI negative case. So I'm very much interested. Okay. I think one other point here is that 
I think building on what Professor Kensuke said, you know, for this particular patient, because this is her language dominant hemisphere, and you want to be able to maximize her basal and lateral reception safely, you know, we we don't we are not able to map language as well through SEEG as we could two dimensionally with subdural electrodes. But in this particular situation, we would have done the surgery awake to see how much we can actually remove on the lateral and basal surface. So we would have done an awake craniotomy for the actual resection to try to maximize the area we can safely resect. Okay. Yeah. So that's, thank you very much for those wonderful inputs. I'm afraid we are too much over time, but uh, I just didn't have the heart to stop the discussion because the case was very interesting. So Professor Kensuke, uh, would you please so uh, shall we uh, proceed to the, the didactic lectures? Yes. Okay. okay so the uh, the uh, now uh, uh, I ask uh, the uh, professor uh, Alison Park to start uh, the didactic lectures uh, on the uh, pre-surgical evaluation of MRI negative cases, temporal love cases. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us this morning. And uh, Manjari, Dr. Manjari, thank you so much for that uh, case. And uh, what you're gonna see over the, um, through my talk is really um, focusing, thinking about the case and the importance of the multimodality um, testing that we do to better understand uh, the, uh, where the epileptogenic zone is, particularly as discussed in these non-lesional cases. So as I said, we're going to be discussing the pre-surgical evaluation and recognizing the components that should be integrated to determine the um, epileptogenic uh, zone. So when we think about an epilepsy surgical evaluation, what are our goals? Our goals are to confirm focal epilepsy with video EEG, and we saw that in the case with the EEG as well as semiology. Identify whether there's an epileptogenic lesion, something that we've talked about, and imaging, and what I'll discuss later is really how advanced imaging may be helping us better understand or identify um, lesions that were not previously detected defining the epileptogenic zone, and very importantly, as you can see through our discussion earlier, the feasibility and safety of surgery, um, which uh, mapping can be helpful with that as discussed. So how do we localize the epileptogenic zone? And what you can see here on the slide is that we integrate multiple components, the exam, the history, the semiology, scalp EEG, MRI, PET, ICSOSPECT, MEG, and neuropsychological testing. And the case nicely demonstrates the integration of all of these components to help us better understand the, where the epileptogenic zone is and what our hypothesis is. So in my remaining minutes, I'm going to be going through each of these in a little bit more detail. So the history exam and semiology, the exam can provide us clues and, um, and the semiology can provide lateralizing and localizing features as, you, as discussed. This was a, from a paper uh, published in 2018, and I'll draw your attention to the temporal lobe findings. So looking at the value of lateralizing, 19 out of 30 cases within temporal lobe. And certainly when you think about our case, the most the clearest lateralizing features we had were potentially the ictal nose wipe as well as the, or post-ictal nose wipe, excuse me, as well as the aphasia. And then localizing value, according to Lowe, we do much better in the temporal Lowe with 27 out of 30 cases. And um, our case certainly demonstrates that. This is a busy slide and really what it demonstrates here and something that we talked about in the case is the semiology of the focal aware seizure or the aura. And that can really help us to identify whether there's mesial or lateral onset. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on two of the bullet points here. An auditory aura, a simple aura of uh, ringing or buzzing would suggest primary auditory cortex within the Heschel's gyrus. 
Whereas a complex auditory or phenomena such as music or voices would suggest involvement of the auditory association area in the temporal occipital cortex. So the point in this is that really understanding, getting a good history description from the patient of what that aura is can help us identify whether it's mesial or lateral onset. And as you can see on this slide here, that there are other aura types that have localizing features as well. The scalp EEG can identify interictal and ictal findings. It, are, it, it can, however, be limited by the region of onset and ictal patterns. When looking at the Ebersol studies in 1996 and 1999, he, he looked at um, <clears throat> temporal lobe foci by ictal EEG patterns. In the first study, it was um, there was a group who had intracranial recording and then referred for surgery. And the, those individuals with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, the ictal onset of rhythmic activity on the scalp was seen in 86%. Whereas in neocortical, the initial delta pattern was seen in 84%. A follow-up study showed that the ictal rhythm as onset had significantly better post-surgical outcome when compared to those with a delta pattern. So the bottom line here is that the initial pattern of EEG can insist in distinguishing seizures, seizures of neocortical onset scalp from those of hippocampal onset. However, these findings, and as you look through in multiple studies, are not consistent. This is some data from a retrospective study that was published this year from the uh, New England, uh, I'm sorry, from the Cleveland Clinic. It, it, and uh, it was a retrospective study of 470 patients who had epilepsy surgery. 80% of those individuals had temporal lobe surgery. And what's interesting here is these three patterns or these three groups that were described. Patients with unilateral interictal epileptiform discharges had better outcome <clears throat> when compared um, to um, individuals with bilateral. And the MRI findings, interestingly, did not influence the risk predic prediction, suggesting a uh, localizing value of the interictal um, findings. The presence of bilateral interictal epileptiform discharges and abnormal MRI actually predicted worse outcome. And patients with no interictal epileptiform discharges and a normal MRI had a lower probability of seizure freedom. So what this very nice um, retrospective review demonstrates is the value of unilateral interictal epileptiform discharges influencing um, outcome. Magnetoencephalography can be helpful. It can model sources of epileptiform um, activity and localize eloquent cortices within the same study. The advantage of magnetoencephalography is that their uh, fields are minimally affected by conductivities of intervening structures and tissue between the brain and scalp. It measures tangential fields. And so this really complements your EEG, and, and that was, again, very nicely demonstrated on that case. Now, I want to discuss the concept, um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, of negative um, MRI. And this is really evolving. And so advanced imaging can be very um, helpful here. And so 7T has been used and 7T imaging and processing can increase detection of lesions underlying focal epilepsy. Now, of course, 7T is not readily available at all centers. Um, however, um, so therefore individuals may need, for many of these studies, may need to be referred for to um, epilepsy centers. Interestingly, systematic reviews find increased yield of findings to be approximately 30%, particularly uh, for fo focal cortical dysplasia as well as hippocampal sclerosis. Now, of course, 7T is not without its problems. You increased artifact is a challenge. But as we better understand, as we better, um, as we have increased usage of 7T, 
increase better understanding of the post processing, um, we may be able to detect les um, lesions that were not previously detected with 1.5 or 3 Tesla imaging. I do want to draw all of your attention to the um, <clears throat> a recent review on advanced imaging done by uh, Duncan and Trimmel. Uh, published just recently in Current Opinion of Neurology. It's a very good review of advanced imaging um, techniques. That group has done a lot of work in this area. Diffusion tensor imaging can also be helpful. This provides an indirect measurement of white matter integrity. integrity. It's more sensitive than um, conventional MRI in detecting white matter abnormalities. And the measured metrics are mean diffusivity as well as fractional anisotropy. This is data published from the Enigma epilepsy study looking at diffuser tensor imaging. It was published in Brain in 2020. This was a multi-center um, quantitative brain imaging consortium aggregating data to investigate patterns of neuroimaging abnormalities in common syndromes, including temporal lobe epilepsy. In the, the individuals with temporal lobe epilepsy, fractional anisotropy was wildly, uh, widely reduced. Fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity differences were most pronounced in individuals with hippocampal sclerosis in the ipsilateral hip, parahippocampal cingulum and external capsule with smaller effects across most other tracts. Very interestingly, individuals with temporal lobe epilepsy and normal MRI showed a similar pattern of um, greater ipsilateral and contralateral abnormalities, but less marked in those than individuals with hippocampal sclerosis. So this study, this multi-center um, consortium study suggests that diffusion ten tensor imaging can be helpful in individuals with um, temporal lobe epilepsy. PET has been used um, in evaluation of individuals with refractory epilepsy for over 40 years, and it can identify areas of focal um, cerebral hypometabolism. Um, the ligand we typically use is the fluoridated FDG. There are, however, other ligands that um, are in research that may be useful to help us better understand the epileptogenic zone as well as pathogenesis, elucidate the underlying pathogenesis. PET can be useful for lateralization and general localization, as seen very nicely in the case. It, however, cannot be used to define surgical margins. Um, it tends to be more regional. And in the case, we saw clear hypometabolism in the mesial as well as basal structures of the temporal lobe. And as I stated, other ligands may be useful but have current um, limited commercial availability as well as validation. But I do think this is an area whereby we may, um, an evolving area that may help us better understand underlying pathogenesis as well as define the epileptogenic zone. Ictal SPECT, um, you have a SPECT scan whereby you see hyperperfusion, um, hypoperfusion, excuse me, interictally, and hyperperfusion ictally. The um, ictal uh, SPECT, as demonstrated in the case here, uh, co-registered to MRI or CISCOM can improve localization of the epileptogenic zone and concordant localization of the hyperperfusion focus in CISCOM up to the resection site is associated with improved surgical outcomes. Neuropsychology is very important. Uh, as we have discussed, it's important for multiple reasons. It can help us better understand localizing and findings that may help us localize the epileptogenic zone better. Um, it provides baseline um, function and, um, and it's really critical. And this case very nicely demonstrate that in our decision-making and thinking about predictions for post-operative um, functioning. Some individuals, um, you may want to better understand memory and language function. You may want to better lateralize that. And for, the, for those individuals, the intracarotid amitol procedure, otherwise known as the WADA test, can be used. It lateralizes language and memory function. 
Increasingly, however, we are using a functional MRI. And using functional MRI, auditory and visual naming um, reliably activate temporal lobe regions. And analysis of the white matter tracts can aid in surgical planning and minimize language decline after surgery. Um, a meta-analysis did, however, uh, found poor concordance between functional MRI and intracarotid sodium amytal test. Um, for memory lateralization in further in temporal lobe epilepsy. This is an area, however, where there is further study. And as stated, um, functional MRI, as you can see in the case that was demonstrated, is taking an increasingly larger role in help us, helping us um, define the areas of dysfunction, as well as helping us predict post-operative um, outcome and um, functioning. For many individuals, we um, we put these, uh, you know, we build, we use all of these tests, all of these modalities to build our hypothesis. And um, stepping back, as uh, Dr. Manjari went through with her case nicely, repeatedly going back to the case, repeatedly going back to the data, and asking ourselves, how, are we able to identify the epileptogenic zone? And do we have enough information? And so for many cases, particularly in non-lesional cases, we consider invasive EEG. In those, we use this to better define the epileptogenic zone in, for temporal lobe epilepsy, determine whether the hippocampus is involved or whether it can be spared, particularly if you have con some concerns about loss of uh, memory function, for, and in this case, verbal memory function. And, you know, as uh, Dr. Uh, as Guy said, um, the we don't it, we're not as it's not as useful for mapping. <clears throat> we are, however, having increasing experience with mapping, and I do think in time that we'll better understand the utility of mapping within stereo EG. And certainly at Columbia, we do uh, map most of these um, all of these cases to try and better, as I said, understand. But uh, we do, if we're concerned about it, uh, we will do um, intraoperative um, awake mapping. I just wanted to do a brief review here in closing in discussing subdural versus stereo EEG. The landscape of um, intracranial monitoring uh, in the US, for example, has changed dramatically. In um, France, Stereo EEG has been used for many, many years, and that has really changed in the US over the past uh, decade. And the, in this table here, what I demonstrate here is just thinking about um, stereo EEG versus subdural. And um, certainly if the lesion is deeply located, um, if you wanna do bilateral explorations after subdural failure, um, the method of choice that we are increasingly using is um, stereo EEG. And I would say that for us at Columbia now, stereo EEG is to our, our go-to method. And that's typically because it offers many advantages in accessing deeper structures. As I as stated, we're getting increasing experience with um, mapping. And uh, it's much, much better tolerated. And that certainly is something that needs to be factored into the um, decision-making process. Many patients who previously would not have proceeded with a surgical implant because of the um, tolerability of subdural are, um, are be, essentially it's opening up um, epilepsy surgery as an option for those individuals um, who were concerned about that. So in, conclu in conclusion, what I hope I have demonstrated over uh, through my didactic lecture uh, is that really when approaching these cases, non-lesional cases, the integrative approach is critical to determine the epileptogenic zone. And for many of these patients, they need to be referred to centers whereby these can be um, these as other tests or advanced imaging, for example, can be performed. And so think about when you think about these cases, integrate the semiology, the electrophysiology, the findings from magnetoencephalography, imaging, just because on your uh, early imaging, your 1.5, 
your three T, go back to those. I mean, you saw that in live time with those of us looking back here at that MRI and saying, well, actually we do see some findings. And as stated, advanced uh, techniques may increase the detection of underlying um, lesions neuropsychological testing, and, and then with um, invasive EEG. So with that, I close. And thank you very much for your attention. And um, we will move on in the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nelson Park, uh, for your, uh, the wonderful, uh, the clear cut and uh, uh, comprehensive uh, the lecture. Uh, may I ask one question? Uh, because this is a you know a webinar for uh, Asian Oceanian lesion, especially for uh, resource limiting the doctors uh, working in resource limiting uh, environment. So in those environment environments, so what is most important uh, there for uh, the preoperative evaluation of uh, the uh, MRI negative case temporal lobe epilepsy? Well, I think difficult. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's a difficult question. But, you know, I think that what's really important to be perfectly honest here, and if you think about the case that Dr. Manjari presented, it really goes back to the history. Like, if you think about that, I mean, that's where, you know, that hypothesis was built on that description that she gave. And so those tests that we use really um, help clarify that and build on that hypothesis. But in many ways, it, it really demands that you take more time with those patients. What, what is it that you felt? Ask them repeatedly, go back to that. She, her semiology was different through um, multiple seizures and very and, and elucidated in that, the, the way she described it. She didn't have that fear um, or palpitations with the first one. So I think that it really behooves all of us, whether we are at centers that have access to these modalities or not, to really go back to that because that, is the important piece. EEG is very helpful. You know, EEG and, and looking at all the subtle changes in EEG, you know, looking back, thinking back to that EEG, that dropout of that spindle really helped us localize that. You know, when you first glance, you didn't see it. So those two modalities together that most of us have access to where are they are critical and that's where you start your hypothesis and these other tests will build on that and of course they're very helpful and it makes us all feel you know it and particularly when planning uh, the invasive EEG but you all of you you know take the extra time and um, with the history the semiology as well as thorough review of the EEG Oh yeah, uh, that is a very Im important thing. Uh, the, thank you, uh, thank very, thank you very much for your uh, comment. So, the yeah, yeah history, uh, the semiology, and uh, the you know scalp EEG uh, is uh, you know very basic, but they are kind of gold information. Yeah, I quite agree. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, uh, Sarat, uh, shall we move to the uh, uh, Doctor uh, McCann's lecture? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, so I please now, take uh, as much time as you want. Please don't feel constrained. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I the, wanted to say that this, I wanted to say the same thing to Alison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was, was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the professor uh, Makan, uh, could you start uh, the your, uh, didactic lecture for us about uh, epilepsy surgery for MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy? Uh, you're mute. Oh, no, I cannot hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I oh, just okay. I, I had to okay. unshare. It wasn't allowing me to turn on. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, yeah. OK, great. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation. and. You know, as we all see with that case discussion, I mean, these are incredibly difficult and complex cases. And uh, I'm going to run through three quick case scenarios where we're not going to have time to go into all the details, but just to just to emphasize the surgical options available for MRI negative temporal lobe epilepsy. And 
I just want to give acknowledgments. Obviously, uh, epilepsy surgery is a key sport. Our head of pediatric neurosurgery and Dr. Pack and all of her team of adult and pediatric neurologists, epilepsy neurologists, and just colleagues who I continue to learn from, Jorge Gonzalez Martinez and Patrick Chauval, Bob Gross at Emily at Emory, uh, Professor Duncan, all we all learn from each other, and, and forums like this are critical for that. But I think it's very important for all of us to remember when we're looking at non-lesional temporal lobe epilepsy that in fact, we're looking at, an, at, at really best case scenario, a seizure freedom on average around 60%. And so when we're looking at that, we have to be really, really careful as we're formulating surgical plans and figuring out how do we best help patients while minimizing morbidity. So when we look at what are the surgical options in a patient, so sometimes as a patient, you have enough information to say anteromesial temporal lobectomy makes, say, it makes sense. Rarely would you have enough information to do a selective hippocampal procedure up front in somebody who's MRI negative. In patients like the one we looked at, we can do stereo EEG followed potentially by anterior temporal lobectomy, tailored resection, or laser ablation. In patients who have very intact high function, we could do stereo EEG potentially followed by resp responsive neurostimulation. And even sometimes it makes sense in this patient population to be considering hippocampal or anterior nucleus thalamic DBS. So a lot of surgical tools depending on the patient. So this depends on the seizure laterality, localization, and the patient's neurocognitive status and how much risk they're at from the surgery itself. So the first case is a very high functioning 35 year old with several years of right temporal lobe epilepsy with a choroidal fissure cyst on MRI, but otherwise a very symmetric hippocampus. And as I said, very, very intelligent and very high IQ. Pet, subtle, mild right temporal hypometabolism, but both lateral and mesial temporal neocortical and hippocampal. A neuropsych, non-lateralizing, again, extremely high functioning. So I would have said that prior to when we started doing stereo EEG, in this particular patient at their function level, we would have done a subdural implant and not a generous anterior temporal lobectomy because we would not have wanted to subject someone to that much brain loss who's so high functioning. But this was actually one of our early SEEG cases, so potentially followed by litter resection. In the future, maybe we'll end up with non-invasive seizure localization followed by neuromodulation, but we're not there yet. So this was one of our very first SEEGs. We did a very limited implant, look, trying to look lateral versus mesial temporal. As uh, correctly shown in the case we looked at, we would do a more extensive implant now, although we probably would end up with about 10 electrodes now instead of six, 10 to 11. And so we did a hair, a hair sparing implant of SEEG. And what we found is very focal seizure onsets in this case in the hippocampal head and body. And so for this particular patient, this was again also early on in laser ablation, but one of our early laser ablation patients. And so your options would be, you could think about a selective removal. You could think about transylvian, transulcal, or subtemporal approach to the mesial temporal structures. You could consider gamma knife in some parts of the world, although it doesn't do as well as open surgery and obviously has long-term radiation effects in a young adult. But in this particular case, we did laser ablation. And so laser ablation, for those who are not familiar with it, is implanting a stereotactic laser fiber through a very small drill hole, just like implanting an SEEG electrode. And then in real, at real time MRI thermometry, estimating the damage of what we're doing. This is automatic trajectory planning developed by the Duncan Group at University College London to plan the trajectory down the hippocampus to the amygdala. And with any sort of stereotactic planning system, you then can uh, in, implant the laser fiber. This is what it looks like in the MRI prior to treatment. You can see the air in the cannula. The laser fiber is only at the tip of the cannula. And so what we do is we sequentially make a lesion and back up the laser fiber, make another lesion, back up the laser fiber, make another lesion. And that allows you to make your overall structural lesion. So here's just a very fast video sped up of what it looks like making a lesion and then moving posteriorly. And so on average, we make three to four fairly significant lesions for this. 
And so this is a, a, a anteromesial laser ablation, minimally invasively done. The average stay is one night in the hospital and much faster recovery than open surgery. And so this particular patient is more than five years out and seizure free with no neuropsychological change. So what we found about laser ablation is that this is a series put together that we were part of by the group at Jefferson. Chen Wu was the, the primary author. And uh, what we found is that in this large series that 58% of patients were seizure free at one and two years, but that ablation of the more inferior anterior and mesial structures in the green was what was most important in achieving seizure freedom. So when we summarize open surgery versus laser surgery, once we've determined that the seizures are truly mesial onset, open surgery does better. A lot of these are MTS cases, but open surgery does better. And it makes sense that it would because we're able to remove a lot more brain than we are able to ablate with laser. But it's, it's a bigger surgery with more potential collateral damage, requires a craniotomy. It's a longer surgery. Our patients still go in the ICU overnight. Most patients are in the hospital two or three days and a longer recovery. So in our practice, laser ablation is used a lot for mesial onset temporal lobe epilepsy as long as the patient recognizes that their chance of seizure freedom will not be as good as open surgery. But it is safe and very likely cost effective. It's for patients also who are unwilling to undergo open surgery, which is sometimes the case. And in the particular case, like the one I just showed, if the case is MRI normal, but the seizures are localized by stereo EEG to the mesial structures, then laser ablation is a valid option. And so what we often find is that it's often a first line treatment for mesial temporal epilepsy, but re repeat ablations or open resection remain viable options if the patient is not seizure free. And there is a prospective trial ongoing to optimize ablation volumes and targets and to look at outcomes. This is a Medtronic study called the SLATE study, but this is only for mesial temporal sclerosis. So a patient such as this one would actually not be included in that study. And this is a paper we wrote several years ago, back in 2017, of 30 patients of whom 18 had MTS and 12 were MRI normal, but all of them who were MRI normal had SEEG confirmed mesial temporal onsets. And the bottom line is that the seizure-free outcomes were the same if we confirmed mesial onset by stereo EEG. The next case is a 66-year-old male, right-handed, unusual, adult onset at age 58 with no insults, injuries, strokes, or any obvious reasons. MRI normal, although some atrophy, as I will show, had mostly right-sided interictal, but also some left temporal sharp waves of concern, but right hypometabolism on PET, right temporal ictal onset on WADA testing had right poor visual memory and had normal verbal memory. So a lot of things pointing to the right side temporal lobe. But again, not exactly clear where in the temporal lobe, but when we looked at the MRI, it's a symmetric MRI with symmetric hippocampi, no mesial temporal sclerosis. But what we were concerned about here is that this patient at 66 has a fair bit of brain atrophy. And we ourselves have not had this issue, but we haven't done a lot of stereo EEG in elderly patients. And I know by word of mouth that some of my colleagues' worst complications have been in patients, elderly patients with a lot of atrophy, putting in a lot of electrodes and having increased risk of potential bleeding. So after a lot of conversation and additional advanced imaging, we elected to do a right anteromesial temporal resection, recognizing we would never come back and do a left-sided surgery in this also high-functioning patient. So we do our right temporal lobectomies now through a, a finger-sized preauricular linear incision. We've gone away from doing larger flaps. And I'll just show a brief accelerated video of some of the take home points because I know there's a lot of trainees on here. So here's our lateral temporal surface. Zygoma is down here, sylvian fissure right here with uh, middle cerebral, superficial middle cerebral vein. We did ECOG, which interestingly was quite active at three points on the outside of the neocortex. And we did individual biopsies there for pathology as well as for research studies where we were able to uh, look for somatic mutations to look for possible etiologies. And then an initial lateral neocortical resection, a block resection 
of a lot of the neocortical tissue. Now with a more limited approach, we don't have as much, as much exposure. So we then have to resect the temporal pole underneath the dural edge towards the temporal pole and remove the remainder of the lateral tissue. Here we are, this is my, my senior resident looking for the ventricle. He's right on the edge just below it, moved up a tiny bit. So we always find the ventricle and for the trainees, the key to temporal lobe epilepsy surgery is finding the ventricle and identifying the CSF space. Shows you initially, obviously, where the hippocampal head, the choroidal fissure, the choroid plexus, the amygdala, and then opening the ventricle on the inferior lateral side of the ventricle. And so opening as low and lateral on the ventricle as you can. We prefer to use just a nerve hook and to gently suction onto it to minimize the risk to the optic radiations which run more on the roof of the ventricle up here. So this is a normal hippocampus. You can see it's not a small sclerotic hippocampus. Just putting some gel foam in the back of the temporal horn so that we don't get any bleeding further back. Then moving in and, and removing the basal temporal structures in this particular case, because there's no need to protect them here. So removing on block some of the basal temporal structures in the area and then we're moving down. Now we're cavitroning down. So we're now cavitroning across down into the parahippocampal gyrus so that all is left is the hippocampus attached anteriorly to the uncus, posteriorly to the hippocampal tail. And so we're basically freeing up the hippocampus. We're doing electrocorticography on the hippocampus before we resect it to independently see what we find in terms of epileptiform activity. Now, oftentimes, in particular, this one, two things. One, he had been on valproate before, and so even though we had stopped it a little before, a little bit of an oozy field. But so also, he you can see he's got fairly, fairly prominent perforators off the PCA with the hippocampal feeders and a very soft hippocampus. And so we weren't as concerned with having to get a complete on-block hippocampal specimen. So we're gently freeing the hippocampus off of the hippocampal sulcus, first on the choroidal fissure side. So here's the hippocampal sulcus, then rotating the hippocampus and freeing it off the hippocampal sulcus on the backside. And particularly in older patients where sometimes the, the vessels are a little more fragile, we can then cauterize the hippocampal perforating arteries and divide them or just remove the hippocampus from them and then remove the hippocampus on block afterwards. And again, so it's a sped up video and a little bit abbreviated, but a lot of the trainees, neurology trainees, don't see a lot of surgery. And then we're just cavitroning the hippocampal tail. And we'll see in a minute, there's a little bit of hippocampus here still where, where the, before the choroid plexus crosses. So we go back and, and uh, cavitron, aspirate that last bit of hippocampus to complete the resection. So this is a, a slightly different for a non-dominant resection in an older person a little more conservative. I was also, I trained in the Ogeman school, which is uh, George Ogeman always preach, never actually enter into the ambient cistern, preserve the medial pia and roll the hippocampus out of the hippocampal sulcus, as opposed to entering into the medial cistern and actually removing the hippocampus entirely on block. So the third case is a 38 year old also high functioning, well-employed, highly intelligent, normal verbal memory, or very close to normal, focal aware seizures, olfactory aura with nausea, also with loss of consciousness associated with them. And just to summarize, so left semiology, frontotemporal insular, sim some similar features to what we talked about in the case today, left temporal interictal and ictal EEG, uh, mild neuropsychological changes, but a normal MRI and MEG implicating basal temporal, lateral temporal, and orbitofrontal on the left side. So we did a WADA test on this patient just because there was some mild neuropsychological changes, and the patient passed completely on both sides with left hemisphere language dominance and good memory support bilaterally. So we did a stereo EEG left-sided implant so this was our implant in this particular case. And we, we, as was shown before, we used a fairly standardized starting implant, but we generally modify in every patient to exactly what we need for that implant. And here we wanted a little more in terms of, uh, we, we've actually got four electrodes here that are aspect, in some aspect of the insula. We've got anterior cingulate, orbitofrontal, and then temporal lobe coverage. 
And so what we found is this patient actually had mesial temporal onsets to seizures, but rapid spreads to some of those other areas, orbital frontal anterior insula. And so, but this patient has completely normal function and with a, a normal hippocampus and a high, highly at risk hippocampus. And so in this particular case, because of the fact that this, this patient does not want a verbal memory decline in any way, shape or form, we elected to do responsive neurostimulation. So we did responsive neurostimulation with the neuropaste device with the longitudinal electrode down the same trajectory we would, we would do for a, a laser ablation down the long axis of the hippocampus with the anterior contact in the amygdala. Most commonly for temporal lobe, we will put a subtemporal strip with the second electrode. But in this case, because of the, the, the rapidity of spread within the limbic network, we elected to place the second electrode as a depth electrode down into the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. And so this patient was only implanted not that long ago, so I don't have longer term follow-up for you yet. But again, these three cases, they illustrate the diversity of patient population and the diversity of surgical options for treating these complicated patients where every patient is an individual decision to maximize seizure benefit while minimizing patient risk. So I apologize for going quite quickly, but I know we're running a little bit late and I wanted to get through all of the cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McCann. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, your lecture is about uh, kind of cutting edge uh, the, uh, technology. And uh, uh, may I ask uh, one question? So. If, uh, uh, are you going to do uh, LITT lit surgery for uh, uh, dominant side uh, normal hippocampus uh, with, uh, uh, for whom uh, the patient's memory is preserved? So in, so in general, we do not do lit surgery in that circumstance. You know, it, mm -hmm. the literature is conflicting. There is a study out that is a combined series from Emory and the University of Washington, both very experienced lit centers, where they say that neuropsychologically, they see less decline with lit, even in patients who do not have MTS. But I will tell you that, you know, we have, we have had a very small experience of patients who after extensive discussion have said, okay, I'm willing to accept the fact that I will have a verbal memory deficit from lit. And in general, we have not been happy with the outcome. So we are still very cautious about lit in somebody who has a normal working hippocampus with a high functioning memory system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the, you will do the RNS for those cases. For those cases, we are doing RNS until somebody develops a better answer along the way through some other technology. But I, you know, once in a while, a patient will say they are willing to accept the verbal memory deficit. But I find I find as a surgeon, and I'd be interested in in your opinion, Professor, and other and also uh, Professor Chandra and, and Professor Dodamani. You know, I, I have a very hard time in patients, even with the neuropsychologist's help explaining a deficit to them and having them get a realistic understanding of what that's going to do to their life. Mm -hmm. And so I can say your verbal memory is going to be worse. You're going to need to write things down on lists. You may not be able to work as effectively. When you go to the grocery store, you're going to have that. You're not going to be able to remember what you want to want to pick up. And they can say, oh, I'm okay. I can do all that. But then once they get the deficit, they're not okay. Mm, yeah, that is true. I see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any other uh, comments or questions from first uh, faculty? So Dr. Kensuki, there are some questions in the chat box. You would like to take up these questions? Okay, so the, the, the last one, uh, I start with the last one, Dr. G to, uh, Dr. Guy. Uh, any cases of uh, the post-lit failure uh, re resection, how it goes? Yeah, so we have we have had uh, we've had a number of cases because obviously with lit there's going to be forty percent failure, and the first thing we look at is on the MRI did we do a good disconnection of what we wanted to, 
because sometimes just like with stereo EEG, it's a long trajectory and a very small deflection off the bone or anywhere can, you know, you can be partially in the hippocampus and partially in the parahippocampal gyrus. So if you're not perfect on your targeting, we will potentially offer a repeat laser ablation, which has a chance of, of uh, resulting in seizure freedom. But the interesting thing is we've also found, we have many patients, not many, but several who we've done lit who were unwilling to undergo open surgery, but once they've been through lit, they're willing to undergo the open surgery because they've <laughs> seen that they're a lot better from the lit, even if they're not seizure free. Mm -hmm. And in general, in those patients, we've had, we've had good success. I see. So like a uh, kind of gamma knife. <laughs> yeah. The only, the only thing I would say is that doing an anteromesial temporal resection, whether selective or not after lit, for the surgeons on the call is a, it, it is a little bit tricky because you mm -hmm. have the cavity of the hippocampal scarring and the choroid plexus is usually wrapped up in that cavity. And so mm -hmm. anatomical identification of normal landmarks is, is more difficult. And so you have to be really much more cautious. I've had a couple of friends who are very senior surgeons who have told me that they've had their first ever choroidal infarct, for instance, in a, in a temporal lobectomy after lit. Now that's not in the literature, but I can tell you it's happened some. And so for the surgeons after laser ablation, you have to be very cautious identifying the anatomy around the lit cavity when you go to remove the rest of the mesial temporal structures. Oh, that is a very valuable information for surgeons. Okay, so the next uh, the question is, uh, is RNS approved or uh, used in India? So, so Sarat. I don't think RNS is approved anywhere outside the US at the mm. moment. Yeah, in Japan either. Mm. Yeah. So we had, uh, just... we had two patients who had lesions on eloquent cortices, uh, the Broca's area and the motor cortex. And we wanted to get, uh, and they were very well affording patients. So we mm. wanted to get the RNS system for them. However, uh, at present, the company was not having the facilities for you know, programming and monitoring uh, outside of the US. This is what they told us, uh, we contacted them. So we hope in the future, just like VNS and DBS is available in India, RNS would be available. As of now, RNS is not available in India. Yeah. But I, I think in some ways, you know, with a new technology like this, I sometimes say like when laser ablation first came out, Bob Gross at Emory was an early adopter. And Bob likes to say, that I would say to him, okay, you guys figure out how it works and then I'll use it. <laughs> and one of the things about the RNS studies, they were very inclusive. And so there's a lot of patients, but now people are really tinkering around and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And so sometimes with a brand new technology, there's a little bit of an advantage about maybe being a year or two behind in the epilepsy world and let, let other people figure out with their patient population what's really working and then adopt what really works. Okay, yeah. but you see the bad point is that the being late is not only one year or two uh, uh, in our region, <laughs> maybe you know, 10 years or 20. So <laughs> that is, you know, unfortunate. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, we go back to the, uh, the uh, earlier questions. So what is the localization of urinary incontinence? Uh, with this question, uh, Alison or um, uh, Manjari? Okay, so uh, typically, uh, Manjari, you go. Uh, no, Alison, you can. I've spoken a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, I was uh, saying it's a uh, mesial frontal. You had said that earlier. You think of mesial frontal as being uh, localizing for that. And that was an interesting feature of that case because. Uh, you were right, it, it's not something you typically see if the individual does not have focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. Do you have any other comments, Mandar? Uh, so yes, again, it's mesial frontal paracentral lobule, uh, but you know, just having that urinary incontinence does not mean that the seizure is coming from there. It could just be the propagation. So the seizures could be coming from the mesial temporal or from, say, you know, the posterior cingulate and propagating to the paracentral lobule. So um, it's important to remember that uh, incontinence is pretty common in uh, people with uh, generalized seizures because of the disinhibition. Uh, 
However, in patients with focal aware seizures, if you have predominant incontinence, uh, one has to think of wider networks or propagation pathways involving the paracentral lobule. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think uh, the uh, very important question from uh, Egypt, I read out uh, the very interesting case, but uh, invasive recordings add any more information apart from interoperative ECOG only. Uh, can we proceed with surgery without invasive and rely only on ECOG as invasive is not available? You know, uh, what do you think? Uh, the Manjari, uh, maybe you can answer. I don't know. So uh, the thing is that uh, uh, if you have, as Alison said, uh, you know, uh, go back to the history, 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 then the semiology, 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 and the EG. And if you're very sure of your hypothesis that it is just this temporal lobe, this structure, and then you're finding a suspicious lesion in the MRI, which is not really, really seen. There's no transmantal sign, but there's some blurring of gray white matter junction. There's some shrinking, uh, smaller temporal lobe. In a resource limited setting, um, to tell you frankly, we have also operated before we had the SEG or before we had the MEG. Um, it's a difficult, difficult question. But then if, if you're in a setting where the patient has no capability of going to a higher center or a financial uh, possibility uh, of the government or you know any state to uh, state agencies to refer to a center which has these facilities ideally these iffy lesions uh, or normal mri should be done in centers where you can maximize the non-invasive investigations um, with a pets ictal spect and a meg however uh, if you're really really uh, not having uh, those resources and you are kind of uh, betting hard on the the history and the semiology and the imaging which you have um it's it's a reasonable thing that what what if you didn't do the surgery what will happen if you don't do the surgery so if you don't remove the say the right temporal lobe which is showing all this the patient will continue having seizures one way is you can communicate this to the patient and the caregivers wait tell them you're not sure but there's something in the right temporal lobe which needs you know further investigations which may not be available there the other is repeat an imaging after some time do thinner sections one millimeter whatever do a dti whatever you have do an asl so, so, so we Our understand been labeling as the poor man's pet and then you can take a call and uh, remove the non-dominant temporal lobe non-dominant but for dominant like in our patient where the memory was knocked off on both the lobes, I would be a little reserved about it. Okay. Uh, it's a difficult question, Alison. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I've been trying to dodge the answer. So I, I think as a surgeon, for me, the most important thing was to spare the hippocampus and the para-hippocampus, uh, especially when both the verbal and the visual memory was involved. And it gave me a big element of confidence on spontaneous seizures as well as on stimulation that we are in the right place. I know, like, you know, Alison was very, very elegantly putting it. The patient may still have some seizures after six months, but our approach was correct. So that is what gave me the confidence in retrospect. And uh, Alison, what would ask... you do yeah. if you were in I a think... resource, if you didn't have uh, the SPEC, CISCOS, MEG, um, Probably we'll restrict ourselves to ASL, which would be the poor man's pet. And, you know, I don't know, like, how would you answer yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, you're right. The pet inspect, um, that it's, it's very challenging. I mean, particularly in a dominant, it's a, I could see it's a very, very challenge. And we, all of us here feel much more comfortable having the advantage, of course, with the intra intracranial recording is you recorded the seizures. And we saw those very nice onsets seen on the electrodes. But uh, that's, yeah, 
I, I don't know. I, I, I would be hesitant, but at the same time, we can also step back. And I, as you were talking, I was thinking about the neuropsych testing, right? And how this individual had bilateral uh, dysfunction because of all those seizures over the years. And so you have to then step back and say to yourself, okay, if we don't do something that may potentially put this patient at risk, so to speak, and we haven't really proved it to ourselves, well, where does that leave the patient? And in that case, when you have limited resources, I do think it's important to look at your information and, and really weigh the, you know, I think guys slide is the best one, right? With the ups and downs, the risks and balance, the balance it and see uh, what the right outcome is because we cannot minimize the impact of ongoing seizures if we choose if not to do anything. And uh, uh, let me uh, add um, uh, one important thing about uh, the invasive study for uh, non regional uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. So uh, even if you use the ECOG, uh, you have to decide the site of surgery. And you know, in case of MRI negative TLE, uh, the uh, often uh, the you know uh, epileptic seizure is bilateral, maybe bilateral, and. Uh, 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 contralateral to the, you know, uh, uh, easy finding. So uh, at least, you know, to determine the site of surgery, you need uh, invasive recording. So uh, Guy, do you have any opinion? Yeah, I think, you know, it, when we look back at this case, it's like anything. When you look back, everything becomes more clear when you have all the information. But I mean, remembering at the start, and we went through the imaging quickly, but none of us or the neuroradiologist picked up an abnormality on a very high quality MRI the first time through. The pathology was 1B. It's not 2B or 2A cortical dysplasia. So much more likely to be more widespread. The semiology, you know, we didn't really talk about the fact that she did have that little smirk on the video, you know, which we all think cingulate, but also could be anterior insula that's still there. I think this is a very challenging case to say, without other information, I'm just going to go do a hippocampal sparing temporal lobectomy. I mean, I think to arrive at that conclusion only based on semiology and the normal MRI would be, would be challenging in this case to justify saying I have enough information. And even there to say, okay, I'm going to be hippocampal sparing and what's the risk benefit of that? I just, I think this particular case you showed is brilliant in that regard because there's so many factors to it. That, that are really complicated. And by the way, you had a great SPECT injection, right? I mean, that is not easy to do. And so to have it set up within 10 seconds, bang on on a seizure that comes on very quickly and without the SPECT, you don't go back to the MRI, you don't see the area. And so without any of that, so again, we, we look back from 10,000 feet and we see the whole city below, but we didn't start at 10,000 feet. We started on our hands and knees crawling through the city. Well, and I think that the, the other important piece of this is to constantly go back, right? So you, you know, you start with your hypothesis, you do your basic, you know, you do whatever testing you have available and keep going back and looking at it and building um, on that. And, and there are patients that will need to be referred because you are not going to be comfortable. And as Guy said, jump, jumping to that um, surgical procedure without more information. So in short, don't remove what you can't put back. So can I have a small comment uh, yeah, for really. the resource limited for the resource limited settings where there is no SEG available? We can also try for a subdural uh, ECOG monitoring. We can also do that, and although we may not get the deeper uh, information so well, but yeah, that is an option where we can use the subdural monitoring. Sure. Okay, so the uh, shall we uh, closing now, uh, the Saurat? Yes, uh, we can. So I have two short responsibilities. Uh, so let me share my screen if you don't mind. So my first responsibility to ensure that we continue getting funding is to acknowledge people who have given funds for this webinars. So we got an unrestricted educational grant from IPCA and we really thank them. And they have assured us support indefinitely. So we can do as many webinars as possible, cover every part of 
epilepsy surgery and we are really grateful to them and my second responsibility is to ask the admin to put us all of all of us together in one slot so that we can have a group photograph for this session so admin can you put all of us in one picture already done sir already done okay so thank you thank you very much that was an indeed a very engrossing and an absolutely interesting webinar we have had and again we will be meeting you during the uh, second week of january after the holidays are over with another webinar on uh, red flags for temporal lobe epilepsy so what are the uh, red flags where uh, you would feel hesitant or you should not do any temporal lobe epilepsy and and uh, uh, Alison and Guy, it was really wonderful having with you, having you with us, and we sincerely hope you continue to be associated with us for all the future webinars. I want to thank all of you. It was really a, a wonderful way to spend a few hours very early in the U.S. And uh, thank you for that case and the just really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Dr. Kensuke. Guy, uh, any last thank words you. from you before we close? Yeah, no. Also, just thank you, everyone. You know, as Alison said, these, this is a normal time of day where I wouldn't be getting more educated, and I always learn on, on, a, on a great conversation like this. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.